heard the hush come over the crowd, so I guess it is, it is time to begin. It's so good to see everybody here uh, this morning. We have uh, a few visitors in the house, and we are always excited to have visitors. Uh, look forward to having visitors, and we'd love to have a record of your attendance. If you will fill out an attendance card, you can just place that in the collection plate uh, when it's passed. Members, it would be a great thing for you to do that as well. Make sure your cell phones are silenced. We don't want to have any uh, interruptions this morning as we uh, try to worship God. Make sure you pick up a bulletin if you haven't already. There are lots and lots of folks that we need to be praying for. Um, this is probably the longest prayer list I have seen uh, in, uh, in several years. And I'm not going to read it to you. I'll let you read that. Make sure you keep those in your daily prayers. But I need to add one to it. Uh, this is Ashley Johnson. Uh, she is awaiting test results uh, on a biopsy that she recently had. So keep, keep her uh, in your prayers. Hope all of those things uh, turn out well. If you are here this morning and you have small children and you're in need of our attendant nursery, we, uh, we have that for you. Uh, we also have a quiet room at the back of the auditorium. One of our ushers can help you locate that. Uh, if you need that. But at this time, let's make sure our hearts and our minds are in the right place to worship God, because that's why we're here. And we're going to do that uh, beginning with a reading of God's Word. Good morning. If you would, please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22. I'll be reading verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22. Verse 6, reading from the New King James Version. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Our first song this morning is number 111. 111. If you would, please stand with me as we sing this song. No way. Thank you. 
How will we please this morning? Our Father in heaven, we gratefully come to you this morning, and we are so thankful for this opportunity we have to assemble here to worship and to praise you. We pray, Father, that we can put all of our cares and thoughts of this earth world aside and focus our attention on you, and may our worship this morning be pleasing to you and uplifting to each one of us here. We're so grateful to you, Father, for the many blessings that you uh, constantly give us and the way you watch over us and care for us. And we are mindful of all those that were mentioned, or the list that was missing this morning, that are, have special needs, and we ask for your special blessing on them for comfort and for healing. And Father, we realize even with all the blessings that you give us, we uh, often fall short and uh, ask your forgiveness for the many mistakes that we make. And Father, we are so thankful uh, for the greatest blessing is that, that you were loved us so much that you sent, this, sent your Son to this earth to live and to die for us, that we can have that hope of an eternal home with you at, at some day. We ask you to be with us now, Father. Forgive us and bless us as we try to live according to your will. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. As we anticipate 
our participation in the Lord's Supper. Let's sing number 440, 440. We'll sing the first two stanzas. This is the Lord's Supper. It's a time when we're called to look back, to look forward, and to look inward. Years ago when I was just becoming a member here at the Fayetteville Church, Brother Bill Benton stood in this place where I stand and he gave this same sentiment as he presided over the Lord's Supper. He said, we look back to remember Jesus and the suffering that he endured to purchase redemption, redemption for all of our sins. 1 Corinthians 11 and 24. We look forward to the time when Jesus will return and we are proclaiming to the world that he is the only answer to our sin problem. 1 Corinthians 11 and 26. And lastly, we look inward to examine ourselves so we don't just go through the motions, but we make every effort to be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. As the men come forward, let us prepare to give thanks for the bread. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we are so very thankful. We're thankful for this bread, Father, because we know it represents the body of our Lord. And it helps us to remember the life that he lived and the life that he gave, the suffering he endured, Father, so we could have forgiveness for our sin. And we ask, Father, that as we take it, that we'll remember as Jesus asked. This we ask in his name. Amen.
Let's continue in prayer for the cup. Father, we thank you also for this cup. And as Jesus did on that last Passover day, Father, we ask that you would help us to remember the blood that he was to shed and that he has shed. Help us, Father, to remember that without that shedding of blood, there could be no remission for our sin. Help us to remember Jesus, Father, and to see him in our mind's eye that he, as he hang on that cross and he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. Help us, Father, to do this in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now have the privilege and opportunity to give back from the abundance that God has so richly blessed us. We know from 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, the Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let's bow as we give thanks for the offering. Father, we thank you for everything you do for us, and we pray, Father, that we'll never take those things for granted. We thank you, Father, for being able to have the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And we just ask, Father, as we give that we give cheerfully, knowing we can never outgive you. And knowing, Father, that you don't need our money, but you give us this opportunity to show our love. And we pray, Father, that we give it cheerfully. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If you would like to mark the song of encouragement following our lesson this morning, that will be number 22. 22. Before our lesson, number 438. 438. If you will stand with me, we will sing the first and third stanzas. I want to tell you as I begin different ways that I, I write a sermon. Sometimes I have a passage that I feel like I want to address or, or maybe I'm studying that passage and so I take that passage and I lay it out and I write the sermon based on that passage. There's other times where I think about a lesson, I see something, and I'm like, oh, here's the lesson, and then I spend time finding an illustration. How can I best illustrate what I'm trying to say? There's other times, like today, where I see an illustration, and I think I really, really want to use that illustration and then I try to work the lesson around that illustration. And so I thought about this illustration uh, about two weeks ago. And so for two weeks, see that's one of the joys of being a youth minister. You get more time to work on your sermon since you're not doing it every Sunday. So for two weeks, I've been thinking about this sermon and how I'm going to write the sermon around this illustration. Now what I want you to know is this is going to be your key takeaway this morning, but we're not going to get there yet. We're going to try to work a lesson around it and then make the application with an illustration. And so as I thought about the lesson, I thought, you know, the illustration, I'm not going to tell you the entire illustration, it will have something to do with, with parenting and raising children. That's all I'm going to tell you. And so thinking about that lesson... The, or the illustration in my lesson, I thought, you know, we could go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, where Paul tells the church at Ephesus, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Certainly, that's a passage that is used often, as well as it should be, for, for bringing up children in the Lord, to teach them about God, to bring them to church, to give them a good spiritual foundation. But then my mind kept racing, and I said, you know what? I could also go to Psalm 127 and verse 4, which is one of my favorite passages because it's a pretty cool illustration. 
I don't know how many of y'all hunt with a bow. I have a bow. I, I've never killed anything with it. I've shot at stuff, but I've never killed anything with it. In fact, I'll just tell you a pretty cool story. I was living in Paris, Tennessee, and preaching there for Whitlock, and, and there was a guy that, that was a member there, and he was just obsessed with hunting. And I had to borrow a gun every time I wanted to go hunting with him. And so he called me one day and said, hey, meet me at the bowling alley. I've got his, I, you know, I want to show you something. So I went there, I met him, and he, he opened his trunk, and he showed me this bow and arrow. And he said, pretty cool, huh? I said, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like your new bow. He took it out of his trunk. He went and put it in mine. He said, it's yours. So I have a bow and arrow. It's currently in my attic. Uh, but I do like to shoot it. It's a lot of fun, and I've shot at deer, but I've missed every time. But two days ago, I was in the kitchen, and I was looking out the window, and we've got a neighbor across the street. He works for Purina, uh, the dog plant. And, and he was out there the other day, and he was practicing with his bow. He had a target out, and he was, you know, I'm assuming getting it tuned up and ready for hunting. The psalmist says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Not in the hands of David, because David can't hit anything with a bow and arrow, but think about a warrior who is well-trained, in battle with precision to hit his target are the children that you are raising. You aim them and you let them go and perhaps you'll hit your target with them and as you raise them. Verse 5 says, Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his uh, enemies in the gate. And then I began to think, you know, I could also go to Titus chapter 2 because I don't want those that are in the, uh, the audience this morning to think, well, he's talking to parents and he's talking to youth. I'm not going to listen. There's no application here for me. Wrong. I want to include Titus chapter 2 because Paul writes to Titus and he says this, but as for you, Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men, this is not referring necessarily to a child's parent or mother or father. It just says older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. That's men. Now, without referring back to the men, I think that the writer here is going to refer to the men, but he's not going to specifically say older men. But here's the qualifications that the writer says the men need to have. Now, verse 3, older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. You see that? You see, you have a responsibility as well to young people around you. Parent or not, you as older women and older men who are not parents per se to any particular child are still to, in manner and word and deed, be teaching the youth. So this, this lesson definitely has application to all of us. It continues on, verse 5, to be self-controlled women, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, and this is what I meant when I think he's going back to the men, he's just not specifically saying it. So he, he encouraged the, the women to teach the younger women these various things. Verse 6, he's going back to the men. Likewise, as the women are to teach the younger women, men, the younger men, to be self-controlled. He continues on, show yourself in all respects to be a model in good works. See, you're teaching by example. You're a model. You're, you're showing, you're teaching the young people. How to be. And then, of course, my mind went to Proverbs 22 and verse 6, which was read for us by Zeke this morning. And so we're going to turn there. And I actually want to 
to look at this passage in depth because it actually does not mean what you and I typically think it means. Because I've seen parents frustrated, child gone off to college and no longer faithful to the Lord. And we sit back and we scratch our head and we say, well, I did what Proverbs 22, 6 says, and I raised him the way he should have been raised, and now he's unfaithful. But that verse says that he shall not depart from it. So what happened? Well, it doesn't actually mean what you and I typically think, Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Now, the application may apply, but we're using it all wrong because Proverbs isn't referring to years and years in the future raising your children in the church. That's not his point in the book of Proverbs or specifically Proverbs 22 and verse 6. So let's break it up, and then we're going to turn our attention to the marbles. But don't think about them yet. You don't even see them. Don't think about the marbles. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. I hope it's open before you. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You've got to break it down and look at it in its original language and think about the writer who's writing this. Solomon, wisest man to ever live. Break it down. Train up. What does that mean? We don't really use that word train up or those two words kind of put together. We might say something like, raise or um, um, to uh, we might use some other kind of phrase but train up in the Hebrew suggest a developing of taste and it, it refers to giving instruction around a child's nature And so you instruct a child based on the child, is the idea. If this child has a specific talent, take it and run with it, and raise him with that talent. Train up, and it'll make more sense once we break it down. Train up. A child. Well, we think of a baby, a child. We refer to children. Well, in the Hebrew, again... Child, the word child, actually covered a variety of ages. For example, child is used to describe a newborn baby. 1 Samuel 4 and verse 21. And I am so excited because today, in maybe like 12 hours, I will see a nephew that I haven't met yet. He's new, he's fresh, he, he probably has that, that fresh newborn baby smell. And I haven't seen him yet. Kristen, has, his name's Zachary. And they're at Paulus in the pulpit right now. And I'm going to see him later. Well, Hebrews, or the Hebrew language, refers to newborn babies as a child. It also refers to a young child, like a toddler. 1 Samuel 1 and verse 27. But it also refers to a teenager. What we would think about as between the ages of 13 to 18, Genesis 27 and verse 2. And so it uses the word child, but don't think about it as from a newborn perspective, which it does refer to that, but it refers to newborn all the way until perhaps even 18 or 19. Raise that child in the way they should go, bending and adjusting your instruction and discipline on that child. In the way he should go. The word in, there, if you can see the in, of course you can, but the word in, in the Hebrew again means in keeping with, going back to that child's nature. In, keeping with, or according to. And so when you look at your child and you say, okay, he's strong here, he's strong here, he's weak here, she's weak there, you you bend it according to or in keeping with, and the way, in the way, suggests the characteristic or the manner or the mode of the child. For example, in Proverbs 30, if you would want to read that on your own time, we won't for time's sake today, Proverbs 30, 18 through 19, it uses the same word here, way, it uses it four times, and it gives us a little insight on the meaning. 
And in each case, all four times, it denotes a set of personal characteristics. Every time in Proverbs 30, 18 through 19. So just so, children come to us as parents with unique mannerisms and inclinations. Our children have certain preset characteristics. And you can see examples of that. Genesis 25, 27. Uh, your child may be very strong and determined. Maybe that's their personality. There's an example of that in Daniel 1, verse 8. Or maybe your child is not strong and determined, but easily influenced. 1 Corinthians 5, 33. Two different personalities. Maybe they're humorous and happy-go-lucky, or maybe they're serious. Maybe they're a creative dreamer, or maybe they're non-academic. Whatever the characteristic is of the child is Solomon's point. Look at the child and raise the child in the way they should go. Looking at how they are. Looking at what they like. Now, none of this is inferring and insinuating that you put their wants and their desires and their hobbies above spiritual matters. But raise the child in the way that they should go. Shooting their arrows or your arrows as the child in a specific direction that is unique to that child. And this is an instruction to, to raise your child in accordance to the tenor of his way, especially fitting his individuality. Uh, for example, if you have a child that's academically inclined, and you see that as a parent, maybe aim that child to college. If you have a child that's musically gifted, as a parent, encourage them, aim them to be a song leader and use that talent. Maybe you have a child that is specifically tender-hearted. Aim them to maybe be a caregiver. Again, you're looking at the child and raising them in the way that they should go. And it's not necessarily a spiritual application. Now this might help us as parents to avoid some common mistakes. Let me just say a few things that are some mistakes and frustrations of parents and, and some things that this proper understanding of Proverbs 22, 6 might help. Number one, uh, simply rearing our kids the way that we were reared might not help. Again, adjusting to the child. Another one, another frustration, is handling all children the same way. I promise you, me and my other siblings were not raised the same way. In fact, my brother and I were not raised the same way. I got probably twice as many spankings as he did. He was very creative. He was very adventurous. He had a huge imagination. He loved to go out in the backyard and play and learn and, and, and he's currently working on his master's degree and, and he's very fluent in the Greek language. He's about to study the Hebrew language. He's completely different than I am. I love sports. Completely different personalities. And we were raised completely different. And, and so th this passage in Proverbs 22, 6 is implying that maybe children, all of them shouldn't be raised the same way. Direct your raising towards that child. And it certainly shouldn't, um, a mistake that shouldn't be made is comparing all children to other children or comparing children to other children. Well, I have this child and it, it has uh, uh, this problem or this problem, but I see those children over there that, well, don't compare children. You, you raise your child in the way they should go. When he is old, and this does not refer to maybe retirement age or, or what we might refer to as elderly, it's simply referring to as an adult. When they leave home, when he is old and you've raised that child and you have directed and you have altered and, and you have um, specifically raised that child in the way they should go when they're an adult, chances are they will not depart from it. Now, 
He will not depart from it. This should not be a passage to teach the impossibility of apostasy. And what I mean by that is this is not a passage where Solomon is saying, well, once saved, always saved. If you raise a child in the church, they'll never fall away, which some people use this passage to say. See, Solomon says they're never going to fall away. Well, that's not what he's saying. In fact, he's not even promising that if you raise the child specifically, um, um, you know, guiding that child in the way that child should go, Solomon's not even promising the end result that they'll stay faithful or that they will uh, continue to um, be, be the kind of child that you wanted them to be. He's not even promising that. But he's saying that the chances of that happening are far greater than if you don't. And if you wait until they're older, it's going to be harder to teach an adult. Let me explain this. This might help. And then we're going to turn our attention to an illustration. you got to understand the nature of Proverbs. The whole book. What, what a proverb is. Which is Proverbs 22 and verse 6. What is it? What is Solomon doing? Is he saying, if I take my child to church, they'll go to church for the rest? No, he's not saying that. You see, the book of Proverbs is a book of general rules, not guarantees. He's not saying every time you do X, you, you get Y. He, he's just saying that if you do this, the chances of this end result are, are greater. If you raise a child the way they should go, if they're musically inclined and you raise him that direction, chances are when he's an adult, he'll use that talent because you raised him that way. Instead of looking at that child and saying, I don't want you to be a song leader. I'm not a song leader. He's not a song leader. You're not going to be a song leader. I've heard parents say, and I don't even remember where I heard this, but I heard them say uh, at one occasion that they, they were referring to the fact that their child wanted to learn piano. And the parent said, I don't like piano, so I'm not going to teach my child to play piano. If your child wants to learn piano, get a cheap piano and, t and let them learn. And if they don't like it after they learn, let them decide that on their own. Raise a child in the way they should go. And so the book of Proverbs are never intended to be an absolute promise. Instead, they are probabilities of things that are genuinely true. Let me give you two examples, and then we're going to turn our attention but generally true. Proverbs 10 and verse 27, for example, says that those that fear God will live a long life. Those that fear God will live a long life. Well, even those that don't fear God can live a long life. And so that, that proverb is not guaranteed and 100% true. It's just a general rule. If you fear God, you're not going to get drunk and go out and drive and kill yourself. Another proverb, Proverbs 10 and verse 4, says that the hard-working individual will become rich. Well, you can work hard, but maybe never become rich. It's just a general rule. It's, it's not a guarantee. And so that's the, the mindset, or that's the idea, the application behind Proverbs Solomon is simply saying, if you have a child, and you look at that child, and it's got unique talents, and it's got uh, special needs, or whatever the case, and you, you alter, or you govern your discipline and raising towards the, the uniqueness of that child, and you raise that child, when he's old, he's going to follow that instruction. Now, 